So if we have a wave of any type, we can have a wave traveling on a string, for example. So this is our string wave. We can have a wave of particles like electrons that are traveling in some sort of wave. We can have sound waves. Any wave that travels of any type can be described by a single wave equation. And in this video, we're going to derive that wave equation that can be applied to any wave. So if we have, let's just simplify our problem and consider a wave traveling along a string. So if we have a wave traveling along a string, we're going to zoom in to a certain element of that string, which we're going to call a string element. So if we have the string element over here, we're going to focus on some length called L. And this length of the string element has a differential mass element, dm. And we're going to be working with differentials because we're looking at an infinitesimally small part of the string. And then this string has a linear density, a linear density of mu. And this is equal to m over the length of the string. So let's assume that the wave amplitude is small so that the element is tilted only slightly from the x-axis. So we are going to insert this into a y and x-axis plot. So if we look at this, we can assume that there are two forces of equivalent magnitude, equal magnitude, acting on each end of the string. So on the left, we have this F1 acting, and on the right, we have an F2 acting. And the reason why there needs to be a force is because there needs to be a force from um, consecutive string elements that are next to each other pulling on each other so the wave can create the sine or cosine shape. Otherwise, it wouldn't be moving through the string with a wave shape. So there needs to be some tension force along the string that's pulling each element into the wave shape. So we're going to call the magnitude of F1 is equal to the magnitude of F2, which is equal to tau or the tension along the string. So um, because the string is slightly curved, the two forces don't simply cancel each other out. Instead, they combine to produce a net force that is pointing upwards, right? Um, it'll have an upward acceleration a y. So using Newton's second law, we get f2y minus f1y is equal to the differential mass times the acceleration in the y direction, which is pointing up. So I'm just going to specify that acceleration is upwards as well. So let's analyze this equation piece by piece. So I'm going to start with the mass because that's the easiest. So if we start with the mass of the string element, we know that in dm is equal to um, mu times L. Since we know the linear density, mu is equal to m over the entire length. So dm is equal to mu times that small length of the string element. And because the string only has a slight tilt, L is approximately equal to dx, which is the change in length along the x direction. So by this, we get dm equals mu times dx. And that is one of our key equations that we're going to keep in mind. Okay, and for acceleration, we know that um, acceleration in the y direction is just the second derivative of the y um, position, displacement with respect to time. So now we're going to move on to the last component of that equation, which is the force. And this is a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to redraw the graph that we just had before. So we have 
f1 and we have f2 right pointing this way and if we consider a tangent line to f2 we're going to call that the tangent line it has a slope s2 so since it's so small the tilt of the string we can approximate that f2 y over f2 in the x direction is just equal to the slope of this line so i'm going to mark that in red so there is a slope and the slope of that tangent line is equal to s2 so that's where we're getting s2 in our equation and since the magnitude of f2 is equal to tau we can relate that in this equation over here so tau is equal to the magnitude of f2 and we calculate magnitudes using something that's similar to the pythagorean theorem like so right and we know that the string is only slightly tilted so string is slightly tilted and this tells us that um, the component in the y direction is much smaller than the component in the x direction why because it makes sense right if it's only tilted slightly upwards then the displacement y is going to be very small but the displacement x isn't going to be that small um, and the force in the y direction is going to be very small as well so if we get this approximation then plugging that back into the equation with tau we get that tau is equal to f2 in the x direction and substituting this back into this equation over here we get that um, f2y over tau is equal to s2 which tells us that f2 in the y direction is equal to tau times s2 and if we do a similar analysis for uh, the left end of the string element we get that f1 in the y direction is equal to tau times slope 1 and now we can substitute that back into our net force equation that we had earlier where f2y minus f1y is equal to dm times the acceleration in the y direction so if you plug in everything that we've just got over here we get that tau times s2 minus s1 equals mu times dx times the second derivative of y with respect to t and rearranging some of these things we get s2 over s1 minus s1 over dx equals mu over tau times um, d, uh, the second derivative of y with respect to time. And because the string element is so short, we can assume that slopes s2 and s1 differ by only a differential amount ds, where um, we know that slope is dy over dx. So if we plug that back into the equation, we get um, ds over dx is equal to mu divided by tau times the second derivative of y with respect to t. Now I'm going to clear up some space at the top here so we can finish with our derivation of the wave equation. So now that we have ds over dx equals mu over tau times the second derivative of y with respect to t, we can rewrite that as d of dy over dx because we know that the derivative of um, that we know that the slope is equal to dy over dx. So we can plug that in as s and then we get the right hand side of the equation again we haven't done anything there yet okay so to put this in more exact terms so we know that dy over dx if you guys know about the wave equation we know that the wave equation is a function of both the position in the x direction and time so it looks something like this right so y of x t equals to like the amplitude times cosine of kx minus angular frequency times time 
So to put this wave equation that we have here in more precise terms, the left-hand side is only a partial derivative of y. We're not deriving in terms of t, we're only deriving in terms of x. So we can rewrite that as the partial derivative with respect to y. And the reason why it's a second derivative here is because we're just taking the derivative two times on the left. We can already see there that we're taking d over dx two times on y. So it's the partial derivative of y with respect to x to the second, second order. And then we get this equals mu over tau. And similarly on the right hand side, it's only partially derived with respect to t and not x. So we're gonna write that as a partial derivative of t. And then another equation that you should know for a speed along a string is the speed is equal to the square root of the tension force over the linear density for speed on a string with a force pulling it, right? So if we plug that back into this equation, we get the final version of our wave equation, which is that the partial derivative with respect to x to the second order is equal to one over v squared, the velocity of the string, times the partial second derivative with respect to t. So that is our final wave equation, and you have just derived the wave equation. Thank you for deriving this equation with me. I hope you guys have learned something new, and I'll see you guys in the next video.